Welcome. The following presentation was recorded at the annual Best Practices for Pollinators Summit hosted by Pollinator Friendly Alliance and the Xerxes Society. Please consider participating in the annual summit next year. You can find more about the summit at pollinatorfriendly.org slash summit. I appreciate it. Uh, just a little introduction of myself. I'm Carl Dallefeld. I'm down here at Cascade, Iowa, kind of southwest of Dubuque, uh, right on the edge of the Driftless. Um, and I have been working with grasses and, and cool season grasses mostly and cover crops since 1999, almost exclusively. Um, working with producers on managing pastures and cover crops um, have been what I have you know, done most of my career. And today I wanted to talk about, because I loved what Stephen and, and Gabe were talking about on the, with the natives, but here in the Midwest, we have um, you know, a ton of cropland and we have a lot of livestock producers that I wanna talk about uh, how to maintain diversity and, and be pollinator friendly. So one of the things I, I look at or, or think about is, you know, what are your goals when I'm talking to a producer? Um, you know, what are you gonna be grazing? How are you gonna be managing it? And really what it boils down to, uh, especially with land prices the way they are right now, that we need to have profitable livestock production. And in order to achieve that, we're gonna need uh, forage quality. If we're producing, you know, grass-based milk or or meat, uh, we have to have that profitability. And then also at the same hand, we want to enhance our soils. We want we want some regeneration. We definitely need it in the soils in the upper Midwest here. So that would be, you know, managing to increase that soil health and then in turn have thriving communities, whatever livestock below, above ground critters, everybody. So in my mind, they're, they're really, when we're talking about the segment that I'm talking about today, there are really three types of, of pastures. And cover crops can be a forage, so I, I call that the annual pastures. And then there are perennial pastures, which are uh, shorter term, and they might be in a rotation with, with uh, uh, row crops. And then permanent pastures are, uh, more what I think Gabe and, and Stephen were talking about. So when you're looking at selecting what am I going to plant, especially if this is a, a new seeding, uh, you're looking at it being a, a uh, perennial pasture, not necessarily a permanent pasture. Um, I like to see a good mix of grasses, clovers, and forbs. So in, in my mind, the more diversity that we have, the better. Uh, over the years, I've looked at a lot of forage uh, tests. When I worked for a fertilizer company, um, biological fertilizer company, it was my, my job to look at soil health and then how does that relate to forage quality. And really the conclusion I came to is with better soil health, we have better nutrient uptake, but also the more diversity that we have in a, in a pasture, the, the uh, more nutritious, the higher the quality, and the longer it'll last. So, you know, we were talking about the orchard grass there earlier in a, in a low wet uh, soil bottom area. Uh, you gotta look at your environment and then pick species that are going to, to thrive in that area. And then also, you know, depending on where you're at in the United States, your elevation, your rainfall, your soil types, fertility, and then it really comes down to, to your management. So you can see that blend to the right is, is one of my stock blends that uh, call it Diverse Master Plus. Uh, and it, it has uh, the six, seven different grasses in it. We've got five different uh, clovers in it. And then I like to add the forbs, which would have plantain and chicory. So I wanted to focus a little bit on the clovers and, and the management of them, uh, kind of the expectations. 
bird's foot trefoil is one that in a pasture that I just, I really like to have in there. It's, it is a short lived perennial. In order to persist, it's gonna to have to reseed. And then you, when you look at the soil types, you're gonna want moderately well-drained soils. If you're in a higher uh, soil health or fertility, it'll respond to that. And then there also there's different types and it's not always possible, but if you can to even diversify out with uh, the different types, there's erect growing uh, tree foils. And then there's also a prostate growing, which are going to be hugging the ground a little closer, um, which will help actually in persistence on, on grazing. And then alcite clover is another short lived perennial. It's, it's very small seeded, so it, it doesn't take a lot of seed. Um, so we generally try to put on like a half a pound or so per acre. It's another one that needs to reseed to persist. Uh, it really likes sunlight to, for its growth and it also can tolerate more acidic soils where if you go back to the, the trefoil, it's gonna kind of want more of a, a mid-range pH. Here's one that a lot of people use is the medium red clover. It is a short-lived perennial. Again, I think you're, you're gonna notice that, that uh, uh, that's a common theme on a lot of these because they're perennial pastures. Um, so it's a short-lived perennial. There are different types of medium red clovers. There's single cut and double cuts. If you've been around mammoth red clover, that would be a single cut. It would be something that if you're only going to cut it or graze it uh, once to twice a year would, would do a very good job. And double cuts are what we use commonly as a medium red clover. They can be grazed three or four times. It gets a little closer to, to what alfalfa would be like. Uh, that's why I put on there the alfalfa recovery time. If you're gonna frost seed and need to add a little bit of clover, this is one that would, would do a good job and it can be very, very productive. And then you have white clover, or some will call it ladino clover. Um, they're basically the same. Uh, white clovers are generally run on, uh, they're more stoniferous, so they're gonna run on their stolons more than what a ladino uh, habit would do. Ladinos are usually larger leafed and, and uh, um, don't, uh, run on their stolons quite so much. I like the white clover in there. They're a continual seeder, so you should be seeing um, flowers all through the all through the summer. The only times I see issues with something like a white clover, people say it overtakes, is generally they need to make some changes in the grazing management. In the blends, I even like to put a little bit of alfalfa. It, it likes this, the summer heat. It can tolerate dry, dry weather. Now it would be a long lived perennial. Uh, it needs a longer growth period in order to, to flower and, and uh, be a little more effective on that side of it. But it is deep tap rooted, get into dry conditions and it'll, it'll keep growing. People don't like it in a cool wet summer, but if it's hot and dry, they, <laughs> they appreciate the growth. Here's one of the forbs that I like to put in. And again, these are all flowering uh, species that I, I want in the blends. The chicory is another one that is, is a short-lived perennial in our part of the country. Uh, you can see those, the blue flowers in that picture. Um, down around here, I don't know where it's at, what it's like where you're at, but you see all those blue flowers blooming along the edge of the road, that would be uh, kind of the wild chicory. But again, it's a, it's a species that is, is, has a deep tap root. Uh, once it does bolt out, you need to clip it if you want to put it back into forage production. And it also can be very nutritious. The, the forbs, the chicory and the plantain, I like the, I'm gonna to have to take a quick break here to plug in my computer.
Sorry about that. I double checked everything, but the. <laughs> well, you're still live, so nothing went went down. <laughs> That's one of those embarrassing things. Um, I do like the chicory and the plantain because of the nutrient density that they bring up. Gabe mentioned uh, some uh, parasitic uh, benefits from some of the other forbs and, and natives. Chicory is another one that that actually acts like a, a little bit of a dewormer in, in livestock. And also the, the nutrient density of, of things like chicory. Plantain can have a very uh, high uh, sulfur level, which actually makes a truer protein. So they are beneficial for livestock as well, you know, for livestock. Then we kind of get into some of the annuals that we use more in cover crops than we do in pastures. And a couple of my pasture mixes, we do put in a little bit of like crimson clover that we're looking at here, which is technically a, a winter annual and grown more in the south. We don't have a guarantee that it'll overwinter up here um, as much. I like to plant it best, in, or I like to have it planted in the summer or fall. So we have that, you know, that fall growth. And if it overwinters, then in the spring, you get a lot of the, the blooming. Planted in the spring in a cover crop, it will, it typically gets only about eight inches tall and then puts on the, the flower head and then kind of sits. So it's one that I still, we still utilize in cover crops, um, especially ones planted in the summer going into fall. Bersim clover is another, this is a summer annual, it's frost sensitive but it can be very productive. Um, you want kind of a moderate pH for it. And I use this one a lot in, in the summer cover crop blends. And then hairy vetch, which is, which is actually a winter annual. It can be very winter hardy up in, in our part of the country if you make your selections um, from Northern grown hairy vetch. It has a real vining growth habit to it. So it's gonna spread, creates a lot of biomass um, in the spring for the, the next crop coming in. And we generally use that as a cover crop lagoon. So I wanted to go through the, some of the clovers and some of the flowering things that we, we put in our blends. Because the goal is to, to have, you know, not only productive and nutritious, uh, forages for livestock, but we also want to have, you know, we're, we're wanting our, all of our communities to, to be able to thrive with the soil health. So grazing management, there's a million different ways to, to graze pastures. And it's going to be dependent on what kind of species you have in, in the pastures, uh, whether it be natives or if it's introduced cool seasons, which I'm talking about, um, They've got a little bit of different growth habits, but one of the keys that I look at is, is to just avoid overgrazing. I, I think we overcomplicate uh, how we try to get people to, to graze. And overgrazing would be coming back to the plants and clipping them again or grazing them again before they fully recovered from the last time they were, they were grazed. The one way that you can tell if they're, um, one way you can look at it is generally they're, when a plant is fully recovered after grazing, you'll have three to five leaves fully emerged out of the cool season grasses, the tall fescues, the rye grasses, the orchard grasses, and then that plant is fully recovered. And then always leave a stubble, four inch stubble it, it, at, at a minimum. And this would be in our perennial pastures. I never like to see people grazing on us on the same pasture more than than four days at a time. When we were grass uh, finishing beef, um, we would we would switch paddocks usually twice a day, rarely more than that, but at least once or twice a day, and mostly twice a day. Then I wanted to put on that rest period. You know, you wait until the grasses are fully recovered. Um, 
those days are going to vary by season. So in the spring, grasses are going to be growing faster. They're going to recover quicker. In the summer, they're going to slow down when we get into the heat and humidity. Uh, they're going to want to lignify somewhat and they will slow down their growth. But one of our keys is if we want flowering plants out there as much as we can through the, the, through the growing season, we're generally going to need about a 35 to 40 day rest period in between on these cool season grasses. So when we're rotationally grazing, that's going to allow uh, for the plants to be at different stages throughout the, throughout the whole pasture, not where the cows are, but through the whole pasture. And like I, I heard came in on, when I came in on Gabe's, I heard him say, you know, be adaptive. Variation is beneficial to um, the pasture management, and maintaining the, the, the sward density. Here's a picture at, at my place, and you can see the, the cows are grazing. There's some little more mature grasses out there. But on this side of the fence, and I don't know if you can see it um, on the screen, but if you look at the lower part of the screen, you're going to see there's white clover and, and there's red clover and there's other clovers that are actually down there blooming. And we'll graze this down to about four to six inches approximately. And then we'll move them the next day. These are cow calf pairs, but it, the next day they'll go to the, the next paddock. So a lot of farms, our biggest issue is lack of diversity. Um, they might be an all bluegrass pasture or they might be all orchard grass. Um, and we would like to increase that. How do you do that? Um, we want to do that because we're going to have better quality with, with uh, the more diversity. And it's also actually going to be higher yielding with more diversity. When I was talking about the, the uh, perennial pastures versus permanent pastures, a perennial pasture system, you're going to have the highest yield and diversity the second year, you know, the seeding year and then the second full year. And every year or every year that goes by to about years five to seven, um, it starts leveling out on, on yield, but also your diversity has gone down at that time. So at that point, we want to look at um, what we want to do to in, increase that diversity. This is just going back to that same slide. Um, this is what I'm talking about with with adding diversity, you get into a five year uh, grass stand and you might be down to only two to three uh, grasses. There might only be one type of clover and you might not have the forbs. And, and when we get to that point, that, that perennial pasture is no longer uh, basically economically profitable. It might still be physiologically there, but it's not gonna be profitable. So you look at the different blends. Um, you have some that have a lot more diversity and then like the renovator and diversifier, one's all grasses, all one's legumes. If you have a lot of legumes out there, you might wanna introduce grasses for the, for the health of the, the pasture. If you're all grasses, you wanna add legumes. So when would you wanna renovate or add seed? I would say when you start declining your species, numbers. Uh, if, you, if you have fewer clovers or you, your forbs have gone out, you might look at a time in a rotation with other crops, five to seven years. And then we can have weather events that, that um, can you, where you can have some winter kill to where you may need to add uh, some addi additional species. So what it would be the best method to introduce um, either grasses or, or legumes or forbs back into a, a uh, pasture? I would say probably into an existing pasture, I would, my, a no-till drill would be my first choice. Uh, this happens just to be an Atchison that can create a nice little seed without, with minimal disturbance, uh, get a good seed 
seed depth and a good seed bed so you can have better uh, success. Frost seeding is another option and that's where actually clovers would be the best. Um, but you do need to have soil showing so that you have the soil to seed contact. And when we're talking about frost seeding, that would be days in the in the 40s and nights in the 20s that will work the, the seed into the soil surface. Some people have broadcasted over the top of their pastures. To me, that's kind of the least desirable, especially if you don't have um, soil you know, showing, but you could run over it with a harrow to help incorporate it, get that good soil seed contact. And then a total renovation, that would be the best to, to maintain a profitable perennial pasture. And again, going back to that, remember there's annuals, perennials, and then permanent pastures, kind of that mindset. I do not want to discount the, the natives at all, but Stephen and, and Gabe were talking about. We actually have a little area on our property to where we have worn seasons. That one will come in and will graze maybe once or sometimes twice a year. I'm limited here on my time a little bit, but I'm going to go through some of the annual cover crops. Um, this we have, we have the opportunity on, on the farmland to really uh, benefit soil health, also help with, with uh, pollinators, with um, even forage uh, quality. I'm going to go through these a little bit fast, but we have blends where a lot of farms use, you can see the sorghum sedan, sedan, millet, and cow peas. And then below that, it says WSC support pack. That is something that you would put in a small seed box to add bursine clover and a brassica. A lot of people will go with that sorghum sedan, sedan, and millet and cow peas. But if you want to add more diversity, we have farms that are putting in cow peas, mung beans, the bursine, like I talked about. You know, there's a full list there of things that can be added, uh, which really would benefit the soil health. So what I really would like to see is at least two to three different grass types, two or three brassicas, two or three forbs or broadleaves, and two or three legumes. This is Adam Lash in Southeast Wisconsin. Uh, this is actually what he's going to harvest for his dairy cows. Here's another shot in his field. You can see we had the sunflower there. You can see the sun hemp. And if you look just above his forearm, there, there are peas that are blooming. And if you actually go through, scattered through his, his field there, um, you'll see a lot of, of uh, flowering species out there. This is what in Northeast Iowa, one of my organic uh, farmers that I work with, this is actually a blend that he puts together or he put together and he'll take this as a one harvest in the fall and it'll also go to his dairy cows. And if you look at the traditional mindset, you're gonna think that guy's crazy, but it has, it is a lot more nutritious than anything he has done. And he'll even put in tree foil which is a you know a um, short-lived perennial, but he'll put that in even as an annual. But you can see the phacelia, bursine clover, trefoil, red clover, vetch, cowpea, sun hemp, mung beans. Um, they're all going to be flowering. The sunflower, the buckwheat, and then his grasses. He'll have it maybe uh, sixty percent of the mix, sixty to seventy percent of the mix. And then we do the same thing with, with uh, cool season an annuals. Oh. Uh, we do the same thing with cool season annuals um, for cover crops. You can see we have at least a couple of grasses, a couple of, of legumes, and then I have the three different types of brassicas in there. And I highlighted the ones that are gonna be flowering on this. The radish turnip and forage brassica, they're gray because they might, they'll do a little bit of flowering, but not, not as much planted in the summer. This is a view of one of those blends that was planted in uh, early August. This was sometime in, in mid, 
mid-September. Um, you can just see the, the all the diversity that's out there. It's hard to see, but there are a lot of flowering plants in there. And again, this is another one that a dairy farmer buys this and then, you know, chops it and feeds it to his conventional dairy cattle. So we're to a point where we can stop, Lori, if there are any questions. Okay, well, we sort of um, posed a bunch of questions to you earlier, but I'm, I'm just gonna pull one of these out of the Q&A. Okay. And then I'm gonna ask people if they have questions further questions or you want to inquire about specific seed, I'm putting your um, email address in the chat. Um, so folks, if, if you don't get your question answered, please feel free to email Carl directly. So um, Carl, can you talk a little bit more about, you know, in the, in the world of pollinator habitat, we're all trying to get quote, native species incorporated into that habitat. But, you know, prairie, meadow, and pasture are all a little different. And pastures are designed to provide food to animals that are managed by us humans. So could you just say a little bit about how important it is for the soil to be nutritious which feeds the plants that need to also be nutritious for the specific animals that they're feeding. And sometimes non-natives like clovers are important for those animals. And, and that was the point I was trying to make with the, the different types of pastures. Like I said, annuals, <laughs> perennial, and then permanent. And that's why, you know, Gabe and Stephen were talking about the, the natives and the, and the long, long-term pastures. And I am all for that. Um, I was looking more at the, in, in Iowa, Wisconsin, Minnesota, there's a lot of livestock producers and there are, uh, that are, have a lot of row crops. And these are ways that they can help benefit what we're talking about here today as well. And, and it would be easy for them to, to uh, manage and then have areas that, like I said, on my property, I have a little area that I, we have planted into natives um, that will graze once or twice a year. But with a lot of these farms in their mindset, they can't see the, the long term that <laughs> they're going to have a rotation and they need the, the, forages for their livestock. I don't know if I'm exactly <laughs> answering that, but I think this is an opportunity. I, I'm down here at Dubuque and my little green spot is always surrounded by corn and beans. And years ago, you couldn't walk through the yard hardly and not step on a, a honeybee. And today it's very, very difficult to even see a bumblebee <laughs> if that, so anything that we can do to help uh, on all the pollinators, but help on that. And that's one of the things we can do on some of these perennial pastures. Right. We might not have the ability or maybe even the cash flow to get the, the native part set up, but we can do what we can do with those acres. Because I really don't see it changing. Now yeah. I can go back on, on my little slice of heaven. There's, it's not as much as it, you know, it was years ago, like I said, but we're bringing back, uh, you can see bees and you can see everything else as you're going through in the evening and there's just full of pollinators and critters. And, you know, that's pretty awesome. Great. And that's what we've got to do. We get, if, we, if we can be even oasis out here in the corn and beans. Thank you so much.